All right, well, I've got 1201. So my name is Julie McConnell. I am the horticulture agent in Bay County with UF IFAS Extension. And I am filling in for Daniel as your moderator today. And um, just want to say before I introduce the panel, thank you so much for our behind the scenes people. Um, Scott ja Jackson is running IT for us. Carrie Stevenson is going to be answering Facebook comments and Matt Lawler will handle our Zoom chat. So um, thank you all. It takes a really big team to make this happen. And um, today we're gonna to talk about landscape pests, but before we get um, into the topic, I want to give the panel a chance to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna start with Evan Anderson. If you would give us a brief in introduction, please. Hello, hello, I'm Evan Anderson, the horticulture agent in Walton County, Florida over in Defuniac Springs. Uh, I've been the agriculture agent over here for a while, but recently moved to horticulture, so I do a little bit of everything. Thanks, Evan. Danielle, would you introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. My name is Danielle Sprague, and I'm the agriculture and natural resources extension agent um, with UF IFAS in Jefferson County, uh, Monticello, Florida. Thank you. Matt Orwat. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Matthew Orwat here. I have been the horticulture extension agent in Washington County, Florida since 2011. And I'm glad to be participating with you all today. Hopefully you will learn something new. All right, and last and certainly not least, joining us from the mothership in Gainesville is Dr. Adam Dale. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Adam Dale. I am the turf and ornamental entomologist with UF IFAS based out of Gainesville. Um, I'm an assistant professor and do a lot of research and teaching centered around insects and mites on landscape plants. Well, we appreciate you joining us today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with some of our questions that have come in. Um, Evan, we're going to start with you. This is not necessarily um, pest related, although sometimes it can be, but what do you recommend people do with trees that have kind of poofy little growths on them in storm um, impacted areas? So a lot of times storm damage uh, will cause the ends of branches to break off uh, on the lucky trees that don't get knocked over. Um, we've seen a bit of that here in Walton County, but uh, especially in the more storm affected areas to the west of us and uh, a couple of years ago to the east, certainly in um, Bay County and thereabouts, uh, there's a lot of damage. So when the trees regrow from those broken branches, you'll tend to get a lot of suckers uh, at the tips of those branches. Um, we're posting on the chat a link to a publication that goes over how to restore trees after a hurricane. And, and most of what it's gonna be is pruning, uh, just you know, appropriate pruning of, of the broken ends of the uh, suckers of choosing the, the branches you want to survive and, and getting rid of the, the extra ones. Um, there are of course other things that can cause trees to get kind of clusters of branches, but the most likely thing is uh, just do a little pruning and, and, and that'll take care of it. Yeah, it takes a really long time for trees to recover here in Bay County. We're definitely seeing, um, you know, it, it's slow. It takes a lot of time and you do get some funny looking growth and we try to leave as much as possible to support the tree. Um, I'm gonna kind of throw this out there though, since um, Adam mentioned mites, um, what do we, can you uh, maybe talk about witches brooms that occur from mite damage sometimes? Sure, yeah, um, so some mites called eriophyid mites uh, cause a damage to ornamental plants and to turf that causes these really tight wads of vegetative growth where the buds come out and lots of buds come out of the same spot, but they don't actually expand and grow like a normal leaf or stem would. Um, and so this is another thing we call witch's brooming. And we've been seeing this type of symptom a lot in the landscape throughout Florida for the past few years. And it's a pretty tricky situation because yes, mites are associated with that damage in some cases, but there are also some commonly used herbicides that cause very similar damage. Uh, so over the past couple of years, we've been trying to 
tease apart what's causing what, and it's pretty murky on each case, but something to really think about um, is what pesticides have been used, particularly herbicides around any kind of plant that you see this type of damage on, um, and look for active ingredients that start with uh, I-M-A-Z. So this is a group oh. of herbicides called the amazodolinones. Um, I'm not a weed scientist, so I'm, I'm pushing it here. Uh, <laughs> But this, this class of herbicides is really common and stays in the soil for a while where it can be picked up by the, the roots of different plants and you see this which is brooming damage. And so cases where that is the factor, you'll see a lot of, the, a lot of plants in the same landscape with the same symptoms, um, either of the same species or multiple species, but that typically suggests it's not caused by a living thing. So an herbicide is probably most likely there. Yeah, usually it's us if there's a lot of cross species and distinct patterns rather than insects and disease. Um, that and, and definitely you have to be careful of the herbicides in your landscape. Um, Matt or Watt, how can I deal with carpenter bees? You're muted. Carpenter bees are an interesting situation in that they come up um, in the summertime and spring and summer and they come and attack wood. And some people say, well, um, they won't attack painted wood. And that's true in some ways, but other ways it's not true because uh, certain types of paint do not provide protection against carpenter bees. So the first thing you wanna note is if the wood is, if it's a deck, if it's varnished and if it's stained, it will not protect it against carpenter bees, but if it's varnished with a polyurethane or oil base, it should provide adequate protection against carpenter bees. And that goes to the same thing, to, to uh, the same exact um, consideration for paint. So if you're using a paint, you want to use an oil-based paint or a polyurethane type based paint it's, uh, to protect against carpenter bees because other types of paint may not protect now, if you're having an extremely bad situation, there are insecticide additive paints available that may repel the bees. And, um, but uh, if you have stained wood, you must have polyurethane um, seal on it because the stains provide little protection. And if you have nail holes or saw cuts in the wood, that's an invitation for carpenter bees to enter. So you need to have those holes puttied over or doweled in and painted over. So um, I, in the article that I linked, I, I linked two articles there. I put in one for uh, just carpenter bee control and one about a carpenter bee trap. And the trap is, uh, it can be homemade. So you can make your own carpenter bee trap if you don't wish to, if you're having issues and you don't want to use insecticide, insecticide additive paints, or you don't have the right kind of paint on your building, and you want to just trap them. There's an effective trap that Chef Eubanks put together. Um, he's an agent in Gaston County. So if you check out those uh, publications that um, are going into the chat box, you'll be able to see how to make that trap. Thank you, Matt. Evan, how do I get rid of tiny snails that are destroying my plants? So that's a fun one. And that's one I've gotten uh, several times over the years. Um, there's a lot of snails out there. So first, be sure that they're ones that are actually causing a problem that are eating the leaves of your plants. A lot of snails are, uh, they eat the detritus, the dead plant material on the ground and under plants, and they don't really do much harm. Um, so make sure you're, you're actually seeing damage from the snails before you try and kill them. Um, we're putting a link into the chat with uh, a lot of information on controlling snails. And there's a number of methods out there. Uh, you can get some baits and some, uh, you know, molluscicides. They're not insects, they're mollusks, terrestrial mollusks. So the same products that will work for insects won't necessarily work for snails. Um, you may want to start by setting a trap for them. They are often attracted by things like uh, beer or fruit or that sort of thing. So dig a, a deep, not deep, but a, a steep 
a pit and put a, a tr you know a tray down on the bottom or a, uh, just something to hold the beer or um, or fruit in there and, and they'll climb in there and they might not be able to get out so if you can make it so they can't escape that can trap them uh, you can also just set a plate or a, a the bottom of a flower pot down and they'll take shelter under that so you can physically remove them that way uh, you'll see in that um, uh, document we're posting that there are some repellents that are possible uh, to use to keep snails away from the area you want. Um, the other option is to try and dry out the area where they're being a problem because they're attracted to moisture and humid conditions. So if you can, uh, and I know in Florida that's almost impossible, <laughs> uh, option for uh, particularly bad snail problems is just try and uh, give them less habitat to live in. Uh, one thing though, if you do end up trapping them, you don't want to handle them with your bare hands or if you have to, you need to make sure that you wash up because um, there are some, some uh, pathogens that can be spread through snails and slugs. So definitely make sure that you're, um, you're using good hygiene because we should yes. always be washing our hands all the time anyhow. Um, so Adam, this is not necessarily a question. I think somebody made a comment that they, they really prefer not to use pesticides uh, they'll occasionally use BT, um, and so why don't you kind of maybe talk about some natural um, options for pest control? Sure, yeah, so um, there's a whole lot of different natural products that could be used. So when we think of pesticides, um, pesticides as a term or as a group includes synthetic and natural products, but um, a lot of people, more and more people are looking for natural or alternatives um, and there's a lot out there. So there's a, uh, an extension document that we recently wrote that was post, is posted in the chat um, about all the different natural products that you can use around the home or in the landscape or your garden. And these include uh, naturally occurring bacteria, fungi, um, oils, soaps, uh, things that are relatively non-toxic to, to you and to other organisms that you're not trying to kill, um, but you've got to use them appropriately. So it takes a little bit of education about what each product is, how it should be used. Um, so BT is one example that Julie mentioned, and so that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, and that's a, a soil-derived bacteria. It's probably the most commonly used uh, microbial pesticide, and people typically use that for caterpillars, um, but there are different strains of that bacteria that work on different pests. So the most common one works on caterpillars. You apply it to a plant, they eat the plant that has that on it, and then it causes them their gut to rupture and they die. Um, but there are other strains that target like mosquito larvae or other strains that target uh, beetle pests. Um, so in addition to the bacteria, probably the two other most common ones would be horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps. And these are really good products to use because they, they work really well. Pests can't become resistant to them. Um, but you've got to use them appropriately again. So there's a lot of detail in that extension document about soaps and oils. And there's another extension document specifically about soaps because you want to be sure you're using insecticidal soaps instead of mixing your own soap concoction from your kitchen sink. Because um, then you can run into uh, plant damage situations. Um, so. These are good products to use and can be really effective, especially around the home. A lot of times with garden pests or pests of trees and shrubs, as a homeowner, you don't need much more than soaps and oils. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I'm glad that you mentioned too about not mixing your own. We get, you know, there seems to be, especially on social media and online, a lot of people making recommendations on home concoctions. Um, and using all kind of household items that, you know, they may kill a pest, but they may also kill your plant or they could be of environmental concern. So, you know, that's one of the reasons you're not going to see extension 
faculty or master gardener volunteers making these types of recommendations because you know it's not labeled um we can't really give you good safety or efficacy information and so those are recommendations that we're not going to going to endorse or or make so and if you ask the epa they would they would tell you that's an illegal use of yes that. Yes, absolutely. It is it is illegal to use a product not labeled as a pesticide as a pesticide. And so, um, yeah, and I don't know where it falls back if you're telling people to do it. <laughs> Probably not a good plan. So, um, Evan, we had somebody ask about some large crepe myrtles in their neighborhood that haven't bloomed in two years. Uh, any idea what might be going on? They do have new growth, though, so they're not just completely um, inactive. That's a tough one because I'd have to know a bit about what's going on in the uh, situation I've got there. I, I, I would say that any kind of stress could probably cause that, um, but it leaves a lot of options on the table. Uh, sometimes I start by taking a look at the watering practices. Um, that can cause some problems with plants uh, if it's getting too much water or too little. Uh, if the mulch is mounted up around the base of it and kind of running it away, that can cause some problems. If uh, it's got an insect or disease issue, and we're posting an uh, EDIS publication there about crepe myrtles, which goes through the list of the most common um, diseases or pests that you'll find on crepe myrtles. Uh, damage to the tree, physical damage. Um, crepe myrtles are usually pretty hardy, uh, pretty tough to kill. So. Mm -hmm. You just kind of have to know what's going on in the area and, and take your best guess. Uh, we've had a very wet season this year, so that could have contributed to some maybe overwatering, uh, uh, depending on the you know place it's planted. But uh, you can always um, contact your local extension agent and send in a picture, uh, talk to them for a while, um, and we can try and figure out what's going on that way. So. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna move on to talk about some vegetable gardening um, pests. So, Danielle, do you have any recommend? Oh, she's gone. Oh, we lost Danielle. Okay. So we will get back to her in a minute. We'll skip on to lawn issues. So, um, Adam, what are the small moths that fly up from the grass when you're walking across the lawn, and how do you get rid of them? So the small moths that fly up around in your grass could be a, a, a few different things. Um, most commonly, if you have a turf grass lawn, it's going to be sod webworms. Um, and it might, and it depends on the location or what they look like to which sod webworm species that is. So throughout most of Florida, we've got tropical sod webworm, which is a brown moth it kind of looks like a triangle when it's sitting at rest. Uh, but through north central Florida, throughout the panhandle, there's another sod webworm that's a little white moth that's kind of like a tube shaped. Um, and both are sod webworms, both cause the same type of damage, behave the same way. So a technicality that's not that important. But those are sod, sod webworms. When you walk through the grass and they're flying all over the place, that means you have a lot of adults there. So you've got a lot of adult moths. That means they're laying eggs most likely and the eggs are gonna hatch into caterpillars. So if you have a lot of moth activity, it may be worth uh, doing something to prevent them from eating your grass. Um, you can have moths and not really have much damage, but if you have a lot, then it might be worth doing something. Uh, the eggs, so one thing you can do is when you're mowing your grass, if you have a lot of moth activity, those moths are laying eggs at the top of the grass leaves. So if you collect your clippings and then dispose of them, you're gonna remove a good chunk of that population of caterpillars that are about to hatch and eat the grass. Um, so that's a good way to manage them preventively without having to apply any kind of insecticide. Uh, if you do start to see, so keep an eye on things, see if you start to see any chewing damage on the leaves. And if you do, then BT can be a really good option that we just talked about. So BT that controls caterpillars, you can apply that to your lawn and the caterpillars will eat it. 
Again, using natural products can be a little tricky because they tend to break down more quickly in the sun. Um, so you have to time applications appropriately and make more than one application to get good control. But if you can do that, then that is a really good way to do it. There are some other new synthetic chemistries that are available over the counter, like uh, a new product called Grub X. And that is one of the best products to control caterpillars. Um, the active ingredient in that, if you can write this down, is called chlorantraniloprol. Oh. <laughs> uh, but it is, is pretty safe for predatory insects that are in the turf, and it's safe for bees that are visiting the turf. So, and it provides really good long control of caterpillar pests. So it can be a good safe option. But try to use multiple approaches like mowing and doing that and always look for the pest before you actually apply something. Right, it's really important to scout and get an accurate identification. And of course your extension agents can certainly help you with uh, pest ID when you find things. Um, and, and timing is important too. So, you know, it's not just realizing that you have that, but if you're going to use say BT, it's important to do that when the caterpillars are still pretty small. If they're, you know, about ready to um, pupate, then it's, it's too late. Yep. So yeah, with most, most pests, you got to catch them early if you want to control them effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I love the bagging, the clipping um, recommendation. That's simple and, you know, it's a couple extra steps with that maintenance, but that's a great way of move, remove the eggs, then they can't hatch out and eat your lawn. Yep. Um, all right, Matt Orwat, uh, my centipede grass is patchy and weeds are growing in the bare spots. Do I have to resaw the yard? Do you have to resaw? That's always, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would say in most cases, the answer is no, but it really depends upon how bad the problem is because I have recommended resodding in a, on occasion. Uh, there's a couple things you need to consider. So sometimes you have uh, fungal root rots on centipede grass. Uh, they're called take all root rot and brown patch, two different, two different fungal pathogens, but they have the same effect and are controlled by the same um, fungicides. So the variety of systemic fungicides that have a lawn label that can be applied to control this, but it would need to be time to when the pathogen is active and it will not cure an area that's already bare because that grass is already dead. It'll only work to prevent the infection on healthy grass. Also, sometimes when we have spotty lawns, we might have had a drought, we might have had compacted soils and sometimes weeds, such as this year, I've seen a lot of dove weed uh, can take over a given area. So if that is the case where the dove weed or some other uh, weed took over, um, there are several things to do because dove weed is a really insidious weed, meaning that it, it sprouts underneath the turf grass and then kind of spreads out underneath. And so when a turf starts to go dormant in the fall, the dove weed starts showing up even though it's been there for months and it can push out centipede grass. So uh, some people just resort to hand removal to remove the dove weed and other people can use um, a, uh, a, a herbicide and the herbicide that dove weed is one of the hardest weeds to control with a herbicide but there are two on the market. Uh, I know I've seen still seen atrazine in the stores and that is a control and also the triple action herbicides such as the Trimec ones that contain 2,4-D, dicamba, and MCPP. You have to be careful with using those on centipede in warm weather, but in the cooler weather, it can control dove weed uh, pretty well. Uh, and then the, the last thing I'd like to say is if once you do get rid of the dove weed to encourage the centipede grass to regrow, or if you treat the area with fungicide or you're trying to combat the root rot, I would, uh, in the bare spots, uh, put in some compost and slightly rake the soil, which will allow the, the existing grass to fill in those spots because the diseases and the weeds don't care for compost. They prefer, the centipede grass, when it's healthy, can outcompete those weeds. So uh, those are some areas, but without seeing your lawn, um, I wouldn't be able to venture a guess exactly what's going on, but those are some of the things that might be going on. I would go to that link that I had uh, posted there, uh, the, the how to 
grow in um, centipede, how to grow in centipede lawns, how to grow a centipede grass lawn and all the different considerations. Um, so I would check that publication out. There's a link in that publication to the different fungicides that homeowners can use on their lawn. So I would definitely. Yeah. And, and I mean, basically, it's going to just boil down to we need to figure out what's going on, what caused right. back in the turf, make adjustments to try to keep that from going on, whether it's cultural uh, disease, could even be insect. Um, and, you know, all that plays into whether or not you're going to resod. Um, yeah. I think yeah. Yeah, if, if uh, for Mark Tansig, it depends, right? That was the answer. Right. Um, and a lot of a lot of times when I see a, a lawn that's having problems, it could use aeration, it could use a dethatching, or it could use to have some compost added because the soil is just really poor. And it yeah, to there's be able you, to hold basically nutrients. you've got to you've got to get to the root of the problem before you figure out if you get can to the out. root of the problem. Exactly the root of the problem. That's right. Okay. Problem. So um, here I'm gonna. Uh, so we've got another question about grass being eaten by worms. I know um, Adam talked about sod webworm, but there's another kind of caterpillar or worm that we sometimes see in lawns and um, also in pastures. So um, Adam, if you could talk about what army worms in, in lawns, and then we'll get to Danielle on pasture issues too. Sure, yeah, so uh, army worms, uh, most commonly fall army worm is another really common caterpillar pest in turf grass. Uh, it typically, well, a lot of times you'll find it mixed in with sod webworms, but every now and then you'll find a big armyworm infestation and they're called armyworms because they kind of march across your lawn and, and basically mow it down. Um, so these, some of the best ways to keep an eye out for these, you won't see the moths flying around when you walk through the grass like you do with sod webworms. Uh, but the moths do lay their eggs in these big masses um, on surfaces near your lawn. So they preferentially lay eggs on white things or light colors. So if you look at your gutters or the trim on the side of your house um, and look for these little brown egg masses, best way to control army worms is taking your thumb and mashing those eggs and you can take out a few thousand. Um, but they hatch, spin a little silk thread and then blow away and land somewhere and start eating. Um, but control is pretty similar to sod webworm management, but you're not gonna see those adults and they don't lay their eggs on the grass. So you can't mow the grass to control eggs. I'm sitting here thinking about the white siding on my house. That, that's probably a good place to inspect. Yeah, look at the gutters and the siding and that'll be a good hot spot. Yeah. So Danielle, um, you mentioned you've been getting some calls about uh, army worm and pastures. How do you deal with that? Yeah, so I've actually gotten a lot of calls about army worms this year. Um, this week, actually, I've gone to two different places that have had them. Um, somebody in our county, a lot of people like to hunt and plant food plots for wildlife. Um, and so I went out to a pasture or a food plot um, that was ryegrass and a blend of different things and it was completely demolished um, by armyworms and not just armyworms but loopers are another common one that you might see um, and make this looping motion um, like an inchworm and they move along so that's kind of how you can distinguish um, between those um, but a lot of times um, when you see them and they're pretty big, it's, it's almost too late because they're going to pupate and go into that non-feeding stage um, and then, you know, emerge as an adult. Um, so scouting early um, and, and seeing what you've got in, you know, your lawn, your pasture, your garden, because um, we will see army worms in gardens as well. Um, it's pretty incredible how um, Adam mentioned they do move in armies. It is incredible how one day you can go out and um, everything's fine. And then the next day it's completely gone, um, which was the call that I got. And so um, this week and the, the person that I went um, and met with was completely dumbfounded and could not believe that these, you know, caterpillars could completely demolish you know this plot but they they can definitely do do some damage and it's um 
it's just important to, to look for them when they're small. You want to make sure that you're finding them. Um, BT can be used, you know, in, in, a, in a garden or in your lawn. Um, in terms of, you know, pastures, we have a little bit different, different ways to manage with some of the, the different chemicals that are available um, to use for that. Thank you. Um, you know, something that I found earlier this year when um, we uh, first went, went, started working from home and I was spending a lot of time taking my, my stretch breaks from the computer wandering around the yard. And I found an army worm that looked, I, I didn't notice anything was wrong with it. It was acting normally. And I put it in a dish on a table and about half an hour later, I noticed that it had larvae of some type of parasitoid in it. So that was really exciting. Um, if Adam or Danielle, either one of you want to talk about um, parasitoids or predators of some of our common landscape pests? I, so I'll um, have to find the video, but anytime I talk about parasitoids, there is this awesome video that I show from National Geographic and it is super cool. Um, and it does a way better job of explaining it than I do, but basically um, parasitoids are, are really awesome. There's different types, um, parasitic wasps. This video that I always show is a teeny wasp, parasitic wasps are teeny, teeny, tiny. They don't, you know, harm us as humans, but what they'll do, um, and there's several different types of parasitoids, they'll lay their eggs um, in a caterpillar or a different type of insect, and then they the eggs will hatch within the insect and feed, you know, on the caterpillar. Um, and they're they're actually pretty cool. Um, I got a chance to to um, work with. Um, the parasitoid Tamarixia radiata, which was brought in to help with the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, and so it, it, they're pretty neat. They're, they're really, really, it's pretty incredible um, how, how you know, specialized insects can be. And I'm sure Adam probably has a lot more to add. Yeah, I love, I love parasitoids. Um, so like you said, parasitoid wasps are everywhere. Um, you'll have ones that are big, like like a paper wasp, and then you'll have others that are smaller than a little gnat um, that you would never see. But they're out there stinging insects and eating them alive, just like the movie Alien. Um, it's pretty awesome. Another group of parasitoid or parasitic organisms that I've been working a, a good bit with recently are parasitic nematodes. Um, I think someone mentioned mole cricket nematodes in the chat. Uh, these are really fascinating organisms because they're little worms that swim around in the soil and then they find the host insect, like a mole cricket in this case, find any kind of opening on their body, swim inside of it, and then release this bacteria inside the insect and feed on the bacteria while the bacteria kills the insect. Um, so these things are really cool and are, can be a really effective way to control different pests, um, but are also a little tricky and finicky. So you've got to got to really study up on how to use them most effectively, just like with any natural product or natural organism. Yeah, it seems like one of the biggest challenge with um, some of the uh, parasitic nematodes was just shelf life and um, availability. I, I, from what I recall, they had some some real success with some, but then you just couldn't get it. Yeah, the so like the mole cricket nematode is no longer commercially produced. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a handful of other species that are pretty widely commercially available. And there's been a lot of research in that arena recently. There's a new uh, nematode that is really good for white grubs that was released this year. Um, and that's supposed to be a really promising option that has a better shelf life and actually persists in a like in a lawn that you apply it to. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely some challenges and, and I know we've been doing quite a bit of education on um, just awareness of insect predators and parasitoids and, you know, the importance of them be, and one of the reasons that you want to avoid over applying insecticides or, you know, using the broad spectrum ones that can kill, you know, more than just your target pest. Um, we could certainly get, get off on a tangent there. But um, 
Well, I'm going to circle back around while I've got Danielle. I know you've got some connection issues. So why don't you um, tell us about how you can keep some of those caterpillars off of your winter vegetables? Yeah, so um, basically using an integrated pest management or IPM approach, um, you that's like pretty much everything. Um, you don't want to plant one, you know, one solid crop of monoculture, um, diversifying what you're planting, you know, so you're starting with, you know, what you're planting, making sure that, you know, you're planting in the right spot, you've got good drainage, you're not over fertilizing. Um, that's one thing too, that I, you know, remind people of, if you're over fertilizing, a lot of times that makes that plant more susceptible to insect damage. Um, you know, they're really, really healthy. And so they're, you know, gonna flock towards that, you know. So just making sure that you're, um, you know, using an integrated pest management approach and considering everything. Um, and so uh, with army worms, so getting them um, early scouting, um, you know, finding them when they're smaller, um, because once they have gotten big, you know, a lot of times the damage is already done. Um, and so, you know, in a garden setting, if you're finding them, um, you can honestly just pick them off and squish them. Um, you know, and then if they're smaller, use um, the BT would be is a good option. Um, that's relatively, you know, non toxic um, to use. So, so what's an early sign um, that you've got, um, say, young caterpillars? What does the feeding damage of a really, really young caterpillar look like on, say, your leafy greens? Good question. So it's going to look like this skeletonalized kind of, there's going to be holes that you'll see kind of chewing. Um, sometimes you might not, you know, see the caterpillar, but you'll see the damage caused by them. Yeah, and so, and a lot of times they hide really well. You've got to flip the leaf over, look down in the crown. If you just walk up and look down at the top, you're probably going to miss them. Yep, yep. Yeah, yep. So, uh, Danielle, which garden pest is the most misunderstood? So, I'm going to flip that question around and say, you know, which, oh, I don't know. I'm going to say pest is a strong word, and I'm going to say, you know, I think a lot of the beneficial insects are misunderstood. And so what I mean by that is a lot of times when it comes to insects, a lot of people just assume that all insects are bad. Um, a lot of the questions you know, that I get and insects that get brought in are actually beneficial insects and people are not um, sure. And so I think it's extremely important to, again, scout and recognize what you have, be familiar with what is in you know, your garden and your lawn, because a lot of times, you know, the insects that you think might be bad are actually good. Um, so I was helping someone with their garden and, you know, I um, was showing him, um, there's a book that UF puts out and we'll link it from the bookstore. It's called Helpful, Harmful and Harmless. And it's got all the different types of insects. Yep, perfect. Julie's got it there. And it's incredible. So I was flipping through the book with him. And he, you know, I was showing him big eyed bugs, assassin bugs, and he just could not believe that they were helpful. They were actually helpful. And he was actually killing them, you know, in his garden. So I think that our beneficial insects are actually more misunderstood than a pest insect. Absolutely. So, you know, Adam's one of the authors on that book. That's definitely one of those must, okay. have, must have books for gardeners. They are definitely, it's a great book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. Gonna, and so gonna, also too, that goes back to using your extension agent. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with what you have and you're not sure and you're seeing a lot of them or you just aren't sure, bring it to us. We can help. That's what we're here for send us pictures and so just want to reiterate that <laughs> yeah and some of us actually like when you bring us real insects <laughs> maybe not all <laughs> yes. extension agents but some of us get really really excited about that so that's always an option um, yes so matt or what my deciduous shrubs have leaf spots all over them what should i do 
Unmute. You're muted, Matt. Okay. Uh, they mentioned, uh, they just mentioned, go meet your agent, go visit your agent. And that's great. Uh, I'm going to mention a few things, but the first thing you should do is find out what it is, what causes the leaf spot. So if you can go take a leaf sample or get a, uh, go take a leaf sample to your agent or send, if you can't get to them, you could probably have them come out or you could even just send them a, a very detailed photo of those leaves to determine what's going on. And if they need to, they can get a sample sent to the diagnostic lab to figure out what's going on. So you know what you're doing because you can treat it. Sometimes it's not worth treating because it's something that's just um, not as harmful to the plant that just occurs with the fall. So sometimes in the fall with shrubs that are deciduous, they're already starting to lose their leaves. And once they start losing their leaves, they get weaker and just some leaf spots attack those leaves and then they fall off. The, the, the most common thing I see that on it are figs and persimmons. I see a lot of leaf spot on persimmons and, um, you know, I don't worry about it because it's gone and, and the next year you don't see it again till the fall again. It doesn't really harm the plant. Uh, however, if, if um, there are some annoying, harmful leaf spots that do occur, and I'm more concerned with them on deciduous plants in the spring, but maybe you've got some evergreen plants like hawthorn. Uh, a lot of times hawthorn and roses, they get... Um, Cercospora leaf spot. So I provided a link there about Cercospora leaf spot. Uh, also, some plants like hydrangeas and others get um, anthracnose pretty badly in the fall. So, if you do wish to spray, there are quite a few fungicides on the market, both systemic and um, contact, that are labeled for uh, anthracnose and Cercospora and on uh, roses, the black spot. Uh, diplocarpin, the black spot disorder, and some others. Um, however, I would say before you decide to spray, it's very good to figure out what it is. And then the other option is uh, sanitation. So uh, when those leaves drop down, it's a good idea to pick those up and get rid of them, throw them out so that they don't provide an inoculum for the next year that would overwinter in your mulch or your grass or your uh, landscape for the next year. So Sanitation is a great idea. Uh, it could be something like anthracnos or cercospora, just a guess. But the bottom line is try to get that identified, send some photos, or bring some leaves to your extension agent in your county. And it, would somebody please post that link so people can look up their extension agent? If they don't know, there's that Solutions for Your Life map that's really helpful. We'll, we'll make sure to get that up. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's, you know, even if we do have a diagnosis, sometimes if it's late in the season and the leaves are going to drop off, there isn't any reason to treat. So exactly. the sanitation is always good when you suspect disease. Um, Evan, so weird growths on the tips of bald cypress trees. Weird growths. I love it. Um, well, first make sure that you're not just looking at the seed pods of the cypress tree because those look a little weird. They're kind of uh, soccer shaped, soccer ball shaped or, or something like that. And I've included a link there to the uh, bald cypress um, edis document. So that has a picture of the seed pods on it. You can make sure it's not that. If it's something that is abnormal, you're probably looking at a gall midge. Uh, a number of trees will have uh, parasites or you know that sort of thing that that burrow into the plant tissue uh, cause it to swell make a little home for their babies and um, there usually isn't much you need to do about it they're they're cosmetic uh, most often if you want to try and lower the population you can prune off the the, the galls and get rid of them but typically unless it's a very very bad infestation it's not even worth your time um, for large trees, it's going to be impossible anyway to get up into the canopy without a, a fire engine ladder or something like that. So um, I've seen that on a number of different trees. Bay trees, you'll see galls on the leaves. Oak trees, get them um, out in the woods. Uh, so there's a number of them out there. But typically, unless it's really, really uh, a bad infestation, it's not worth doing anything about yeah, there are a lot of insects that rely on trees as just part of their life cycle and trees are really usually very, very tolerant of a lot of different amounts of damage from insects and, and it's not, it's not going to take the tree out. No, um, and that amount of damage may vary year to year. So. Yes, and, and you will see a different level from year to year. 
Uh, so Matt, Matt, one of his specialties is roses. What do you do if you have um, lovers eating with, or big grasshoppers eating your roses? Well, the first thing I would say that there's a publication from Adam Dale that's right <laughs> available that uh, that's going to be posted that talks about the lovers. So if you have them on your roses, the best thing to do is pick if you could just pick them off and smash them. I would recommend doing that uh, because if you spray a broad spectrum, lots when I grow roses, there are a lot of beneficial insects that control most of my pests. So I haven't sprayed an insecticide on roses. With the exception, if I had chili thrips, I probably would, but since I don't have them um, uh, in years and the, my, the parasitoid wasps and such all take care of the aphids. So I would be cautious about spraying an insecticide because you kill off all your beneficials and you'll have a bunch of other insect problems like mites and aphids. But uh, first of all, I would try to smash them if you can. The only time it's viable to kill an Eastern lover grasshopper on a plant, in my opinion, is when they're in the nymph stage and they're susceptible to pyrethrins uh, when they're in the nymph stage. But once they're in adult stage, they're not susceptible to many insecticides at all. So when they're that big and large, uh, pick them off and smash them. Some people would say eat them. I'm not going to recommend that, but in, I know people that have. <laughs> uh, but anyway. I'm going to um, say feed them to your chickens. Feed them to your chickens. Ah, That's great. Yep. That's, That's a I great do. idea. I love it. Yes. So, so maybe you should you. put chickens in with your roses. That wouldn't be a bad idea. They they probably pick off everything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they fertilize too, because you know composted composted chicken manure is great for roses. Don't feed them hot chicken manure. Um, but Adam, do you have any um, suggestions on what I said? No, I think you covered it pretty well. I would reiterate not not eating lower grass lovers. <laughs> I. Uh, I know a guy who has eaten them and he went to the hospital, so. Oh, darn. Uh, they're very nasty. They, have, they contain a lot of uh, a lot of defensive compounds inside of them. So um, like well, in the, the link that was posted in the chat, there's a specific bird species that eats lovers, but they, they grab the lovers and then basically spear them on like a little plant spike and let them dry out for a day so the compounds break down and then they eat them otherwise so, they so them. adam would would fry would frying in oil uh break down those compounds i have no idea okay <laughs> i'm not recommending it okay good okay i, I think we're going to stick with the recommendation of do not eat do not eat them okay do not eat them. grasshopper we're, we're but what about chickens can, can chicken table. eat them <laughs> I guess according to Danielle, chickens do all right with them. I mean, I I don't know if she's actually, my chickens have eaten them, but I've thrown them in, in the coop and they, she seems to do all right. <laughs> Maybe they play with them like my cat does with lizards. <laughs> so, um, Adam, I'm going to I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, I know earlier this year we saw a lot about the um, Asian giant hornet that the media dubbed the murder hornet uh, being located in, in uh, Washington state. And um, I think it kind of got shuffled. You know, we kind of addressed that situation and then it, it just hit the news again this week because they found a nest. Um, any any comments you want to make about that? Sure. Uh, so I think all of us back, I don't know when that was, but several months ago, we were getting bombarded with emails and messages. Um, I heard from friends I hadn't talked to in several years, sending me pictures of wasps asking me if they were murder hornets. Um, but so like you said, these things, so they were they're from Asia. So in several areas of Asia, they're native um, and very common. So people over there are very accustomed to them. Um, they were first found in North America in 2019 in British Columbia, and then they were found in Washington State this year. Um, this most recent case was pretty interesting. Uh, they found some hornets. They were foraging around. They captured them, put little radio trackers on them and then tracked them back to their hive. And so that's how they located the hive that was in a tree um, in the forest. 
so they went to the the tree they vacuumed up all of the wasps destroyed them and they destroyed the tree where the nest was uh, so they think they've contained most of it. One of the wasps that had a little radio tracker on it disappeared. So uh, that's a little concerning, but they don't know if it died or if it flew somewhere and lost its little tracker. But um, the murder hornet name is really, it's a sensationalized name. Um, the Asian giant hornet, hornet is its real uh, official name. Um, and the likelihood well, I can't really speak to the likelihood of it getting all over the U.S., but I think it's pretty slim right now, isolated in the far northwest uh, and not something that we should be worried about on the East Coast or on the southern part of the U.S. So um, what do you think is the most mistaken insect for that? Because we do have some pretty big hornets or wasps in Florida. Yeah, so the most common thing that I see people mistaking as murder hornets uh, are the, the cicada killer wasps. So these are super common wasps throughout, throughout the southeast. Um, they're really big, so that's why people think they're, well, people think they're terrifying because they're big and they're a wasp. But they also are large like the Asian wasp. Um, but it's harmless. It actually attacks cicadas, which is why it's called the cicada killer. So it flies around, snatches up cicadas that you hear buzzing in the trees, um, lays an egg on them, buries them in the ground, and then their babies eat the cicadas, just like the parasitoids that Danielle was talking about earlier. Um, and they burrow little holes in the ground. So you'll see a little pushed up mound of soil that these wasps are flying in and out of stuff and which, full of cicadas. Which actually kind of leads us to, to another thing is that a lot of times we get calls about these holes in the ground and many times they are solitary ground wasps of one type or another um, that are really what we would consider beneficial insects. So, um, so I think that we have actually answered all the questions that have come in, but I was, um, I was hoping that uh, maybe Adam would kind of tell us a little bit about um, some of uh, one of your projects that you have going on trying to um, increase pollinators in some otherwise uh, more grass monoculture areas. Sure. Uh, so so we've been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years trying to figure out ways to take managed turf grass space and convert it to uh, flowering habitats. So in, in general, there's a lot of evidence that shows different pollinators, butterflies, other insects are declining, substantially declining around the world. Um, and urbanization and the replacement of natural habitat with our habitat is one of the leading causes of that. Um, so we're taking uh, like out of play areas on golf courses. We're taking uh, just your garden at home and trying to figure out how to best create habitats for conservation. So we've seen that if you plant, so I guess in short, Plant diversity matters. So if you plant flowering plants, try to put as many different species in there as possible. Um, that'll support the most abundant and the most diverse insects. Uh, we also see that when you plant flowering plants, yes, you bring in bees, but you also bring in a lot of those wasps and predatory things. And when we actually track um, biological control of turf grass pests, like the army worms we were talking about earlier. Um, in areas next to flowering habitats, we have about 50% greater uh, biological control of caterpillars in turf than we do in areas with no flowers. Wow. So you conserve a lot of things and you help pest control, which means you have less of a concern from the pest standpoint. Uh, we've also been doing some stuff recently with monarch habitats. 
Um, so trying to trying to work towards the same goal of conserving insects and urban landscapes. Um, and we see benefits of mixed plantings. So monarchs only feed on milkweed when they're a larva. So they specialize on milkweed, but as an adult butterfly, they feed on a lot of other plants. So the nectar from a bunch of different flowers. Um, so what we've seen is that if you mix milkweed with other wildflowers, we actually have uh, monarchs lay more eggs on milkweed in those plots. Um, and we increase predator and parasitoid things, but that does not translate to uh, more attacks on monarch caterpillars. So it's kind of a, a best of both worlds. You can serve mm -hmm. more monarchs and you can serve more other beneficial insects. Yeah, I know. I think whenever we start talking about milkweed, I, I know for, uh, for me, it comes up a lot about all the aphids that we see on, on milkweed. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, people are concerned. They're like, I planted those for the caterpillars, not for the aphids. And, and you know, I, I guess I would assume that they're, you know, they might take away a little bit, but I, I don't think I've ever seen aphids on a milkweed or any other plant where there weren't predators there also. So there's, there's always this kind of balancing act going on. I think it's unusual to see just one insect species on plants. Yeah, those and the oleander aphids can be a real problem. So we, um, we just, we are starting a project this winter looking at methods for controlling those aphids uh, on milkweed without having an effect on the monarchs. So a lot of the pesticides you would use to control aphids also are toxic to monarchs. Um, so we're trying to figure out kind of the best management practices for controlling pests on conservation plants. Yeah, that's a tricky I think um, we both you and, and Danielle mentioned well and, and Matt too, you know, there's always the pick and squish. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for um, just mechanical control of a lot of insects and aphids are pretty easy to kind of just strip off by hand and squishing. They're not even crunchy. So <laughs> they'll turn your hand nice and orange. <laughs> All right, well, um, I think unless we have any more, um, I don't see anything in the Q&A box. Um, so I think that uh, we're about ready to wrap up here. Thank you all for joining us and um, thank my panelists for being here and our behind the scenes. We had Matt and Carrie and Scott giving us some, some support. Um, please be sure to fill out the survey uh, it's going in the chat box on Zoom and we'll make sure it's on the Facebook page. Also, um, that helps us just kind of gauge that you're learning something from these um, from these webinars and show value to these programs and, and keeping extension in your local counties. Um, our next and last Gardening in the Panhandle Live of the Year is going to be on November 12th and we are going to talk about selection and care of holiday plants. So I hope that everyone will, will join us. And again, thank you for being here today. Thanks, Julie.